Yeah, we have been in that community for a long time. So they know all the tactics of living, the old man and the old woman. My father is not getting any pension and my mother is not getting any pension, but they are old enough. My mommy actually is going for plowing and a vegetable garden. And then she used to brew the African beer and sell it to everyone. Even though the old man himself is a farmer, but he's getting some little bit of income every, every month because he's taking some other people's cattle, looking after them, and then they pay him. And sometimes he used to sell the compost from the crops. So it's the way they're trying to survive. Relegated to marginal land, survival for rural families takes place in a context where poverty, hunger and illiteracy have become a natural part of the surrounding landscape. Out of this scenario, where some 40,000 black children die each year of hunger and related diseases, the dream of one child survives and triumphs to shine through in spite of all. It all started long ago. So from my primary level, I was one of those people who want my voice to be heard by many people. So fortunately in 1990, when I was doing my standard 10, so I saw a, an advert in New Nation for video school. So I just applied. So until now, when I realized my dream that today I'm a filmmaker, from humble beginnings, riding the gauntlet of an education system designed for failure, Minar Moramoche, together with 11 other students, graduated from the Newtown Film and Television School in Johannesburg last year. Drawing on life experience, his final year film project tells the story of a young rural boy coming to the city for the first time. The film itself is about me. The first time when I came to Johannesburg, my uncle just gave me the telephone numbers and everything without address. So I came all the way from Jane first. Unfortunately, when I arrived at Dinon Station, so it was late. But unfortunately, I didn't fall in the trap that the whole film is running around, like to be a permanent street kid. Minar Muramoche. I feel very much great. I don't know what, what, what can I say, but to me, I think the light will come through from my family, from everyone in the rural areas. I think I'll be the first person if regional television is in place to go and try to plow back my skills that I've achieved. Because at our area at the moment, we don't have any media coverage. We have a lot of stories, so we need to go and recall all those stories and tell everyone about the great heroes that we have. <laughs> All I can say that these young people who choose cinema know exactly why. And uh, I hope they know how much us as African people uh, expect from them. You have to love it. Especially when you don't have the means. Il faut se battre. You have to fight. My granddaddy and my grandmother had some cattle. So they delayed me in terms of going to school because they were all illiterate and nobody was a role model to me to go to school. So everyone like, he started to go to school at the age of 15, 16. So I was just like anyone else until my, my, my lady intervened and said, you know, this guy must go to school. Stuck in poverty, for many rural children, education has been unaffordable, as families are compelled to pay towards the building and maintenance of community schools. At the height of oppression under the past regime, rural schools were occupied by the military and many were closed down. In Sekokuni land, students set up their own initiatives. In the early 1980s, I was part and parcel of those who were the victims of the apartheid regime go through those difficulties when the schools were closed. We were trying to reshape the education system 
So we had to have some group discussion. Like at the moment, if you can look at the rural areas, especially in Skukuniland, we have one big project that is catering for everyone. It's part of motivating a person. And it's part of giving a person a creative thinking. Just because of we are told by Maru and Maru Merindikele. This way of the project has started since 1986, when we were having revolutionary educational struggles. So the students were scattered all over the area. So some of the students were grouping themselves in various groups according to their classes, discussing the school subjects and so on, so that uh, they could be able to reach the examination session. So uh, by doing this, we try to motivate students so that uh, a particular student, if he, the, the, there is a strike or a, caused by the teachers or, or, or the students, uh, that student could be able to, to, to read or to learn for himself. Since the elections have started, uh, we were not having any change at all. We are still having the type of education system since uh, during the apartheid education system. The point of departure is always the urban areas, neglecting the rural communities. And I think if we have to take a step in the right direction, a start should be made in the rural areas so that they should really see change. To them, this political freedom means nothing. They don't see anything tangible. And unless something is done there, that they will never realize that there is any change. You find that some communities don't really have the schools themselves, and they have to travel distances from one village to another, more or less 10 to 15 kilos. That leads to tiredness amongst the children in class. And another thing is the migrant workers. In a normal society, children grow up properly in, in the care of both parents. If you look into the rural areas, you find that children grow up under the care of the mother. Fathers are there in the urban areas. They don't really understand the nature of the problems that the children are facing at home. And with the little incomes that they get, they've got nothing to supplement the real life of the children at home. We are dealing with what we call community schools, where the community itself does pay particularly when it comes to building of classrooms, administration offices. But what is the most important of all problems, we don't have adequate classrooms. Where you find in one place, 70 to 80. Well, so far, no changes, could I say, are visible. But we do believe that in the not distant future, things will start to reshape. Like for instance, feeding schemes. Primaries are being fed freely. And that is the right step in the right direction. And from sub A, school funds will not be paid. And that will ease the burden on the part of the community. Feeding schemes should not be just mere feeding schemes which don't give people incentives to work. I think if people may be given opportunities for work and if we can have non-formal education so that people should be able to survive with the level of education that they have, then the government should do something regarding basic education. To address the consequences of decades of neglect of rural education, large-scale non-formal educational strategies are urgently needed to equip adults with socially essential skills needed for their survival and to help them play a supportive role in the education of their children. Esther Segokodi, illiterate all her life, graduated from an adult literacy course to formal schooling and has now written her Standard 6 examinations. <laughs>
a go fihla January ka hlotleletse ga gore ke be ke kwa secondary ka ba le mafulufulu le gona ka ya secondary a ke fihla secondary ke dirile standard 6 Mandela o re e mongwe le mongwe a be le thuto gore a tla a gone go phedisha bana ba gao Education, it's like a three-legged pot. It cannot stand on one leg. It would need the parent, the teacher, and the child himself. And unless we involve these parents, we will never succeed. And I think they must be educated what their role should be. And if that, that happens, they will, they will definitely participate thoroughly and the education will improve. You know, in the past, there used to be very, very good teachers. I don't say they were highly qualified, but they were motivated, they were worthy models to imitate. And we used to look at those teachers and hoped that if in future we could be like those people, then we would be satisfied with our lives. But today you find a low morale amongst teachers. They don't motivate our children. The behavior is wayward in itself. And today you find very, very few teachers who you can regard as models. The semi-desert environment of the Sekakuni Land College of Education reflects the academic sterility in which historically black institutions of higher learning have traditionally been located. In keeping with the policies of the past regime, these institutions were deliberately isolated from the political influence of urban centers and from academic networks that would contribute to enrichment and a vibrant intellectual culture of learning. As students, we have developed a culture of dependency. We lack self-confidence, we lack self-esteem. I think also in, in very few years to come, the kinds of diplomas that we are doing here will be meaningless. So I think in order for us to transform from one situation to another, even the teachers presently, they need to be retrained so that they can be able to cope with the new syllabi that is being formulated. But without doing that, I don't think our diplomas will achieve anything to, of great impact in the society. We'll just be the brainwashing the society, I think so. I was not supposed to become a teacher. I remember I, 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 I opted to become a lawyer in 1990, 1991. But due to financial limitation of my family, I couldn't go to, to, to anywhere except go to, go to teaching. So I opted for, for college as the last resort. That's the general perception in our rural area where people don't have money to go to tertiary institution. Ultimately, they will go to the college as the last resort to at least have a profession. And that is the legacy that we are beset with. For too long, among African institutions, the education faculty served as the dumping ground once one had failed perhaps in other professions, law, social work or agriculture, one would automatically come to teaching. And uh, another thing is that we've been taking everybody uh, in teaching. Perhaps we need some form of uh, pre-entry interviews to check whether people are genuinely interested in teaching. One has also to consider the issue of making the salaries of teachers a bit attractive. Granted, they cannot match commerce and industry cent for cent, but teachers should be able to receive salaries that enable them to live without economic anxiety. There is a close relationship between education and community development, as well as other aspects of culture or life in a rural area. A university is a community institution. It must address the concerns of the region in which it is established, as well as the concerns of South Africa, together with other institutions of higher learning. And for the Northern Transvaal, it would be the issues of poverty, of hunger, of illiteracy, of lack of educational facilities, issues of adult education, how to improve the lifestyle of people in a rural area, how to ensure also that those who are at school be motivated to go on in schooling. With a total school-going population of nearly 10 million children, some 6 million live and go to school in the rural areas. 
Former Janga Gumbi, today an advocate and legal advisor to Deputy President Mbeki, the driving force to her success was the intrinsic value placed on education itself by the community of Tabanchu in the Orange Free State. The community around me was a very motivated community, in spite of it being very rural, very small, no running water, no electricity. But I think because we were so poor, we didn't have much to go on. And uh, we learned to value education. And, uh, and that, that's the kind of environment that we grew up in. Very hard time, very, very little to go on in terms of facilities at school. We didn't have laboratories, we didn't have any libraries. But whatever you had, you really treasured. And the little that we had, we used to our best. And they used to say that, you know, Tabanchu, as the saying goes, is place of small beginnings but mighty endings. And the first time I left Tabanchu was to go to Varsity, which is the University of the North. Raised in the shadow of their white counterparts, historically black universities were designed to service the bureaucratic requirements of the Bantustan plan. Levels of study were restricted to undergraduate degrees and diplomas, whilst fields of study in the liberal arts, humanities and education ensured that the existing racial division of labor in the country would not be undermined. The white universities would continue to produce the country's academic elite. Students on black campuses suffered strict authoritarian control designed to stifle radical social theory and critical thinking. I think for me it was only when I left the University of the North to go to VETS to do my LLB that I realized the differences in our education, in approach, in, in the manner in which we were not taught to ask why and how, you know, but to accept. And when we got into a class with the mainly privileged children at VETS, you know, who would defy rules, it was quite a change for me. Because then I had to prove a point to myself to find out whether in fact we are the same or whether in fact I'm inferior or is it because I, had, I received inferior education. So it was there that uh, black students really went out of their way to excel. And I think when I got out of it, I was ready to face the world. It is essential for our teaching process, not only in the higher educational system, but also in the schools. Students must be encouraged to question. I think that modern students have been themselves much more independent thinkers, and they have questioned, they have argued, and I think to that extent, some of the conflicts that one has witnessed on the campuses is because the students have been independent thinkers and they have been prepared to challenge authority. It's not always seen like that, uh, although there are certain forms of protest that are unacceptable, uh, such as holding people hostage trashing campuses, that sort of thing. I think that one should not be too hasty to discourage students from expressing strongly held views. It's very important for students to notice now that we have a different government. We have a government that has made a commitment uh, to address problems that used to be our problems and, and, and that gives us more space uh, to concentrate on our studies, to develop our communities in, in that line, that we're going to be a community of educated people, a community that is ready to govern, a community that is ready to, to, to maintain democracy. It's a question of trying to define the roles that each sector of society plays. They want to be at the forefront setting their national agenda. Now it is important to say to them, it's okay, we are here and that agenda is not going to be derailed. They have to be assured that it's not going to be derailed. And to find ways in which you can, can channel their energies, to try and encourage excellence. I think that's what we should be teaching our children. That, you know, if you excel at what you do, that's, that's the best thing that can happen to you, whether it's sports, whether it's academic, whether it's it's engineering or as an electrician.
When the economic boom finally comes, the soft underbelly to industrial development in South Africa will be the lack of a new breed of trainable artisans, equipped with the skills needed to adapt to ongoing changes and new technologies in the workplace. New methodologies linking vocational education, technological skills training, underpinned by the principle of cognitive development, need to be implemented in order to educate for trainability, within the framework of a culture of lifelong learning and education. Entrenched hierarchies within the range of institutions of higher learning, which locate universities at the apex and technical colleges at the bottom of the heap, need to be redressed for optimum human resource development. Admission requirements to universities, technicons and colleges need to be revised to take into account legitimate non-formal education and work experience. Across the racial divide, both historically disadvantaged black institutions of higher learning and their historically white counterparts need to be transformed out of the mold of apartheid engineering and located within the new academic and developmental needs of the country. During this transformation, the quality of outcomes and competencies generated by educational institutions in South Africa needs to be safeguarded and guaranteed. There's no question of a decline in the quality of the product. The professions come round regularly and, and inspect. And if they're not happy, they tell you they will withdraw recognition of the degree. We don't bend the rules um, because we don't take anybody who's not formally qualified to come into university. But of course, many of the products of the black schools have shortfalls that need to be made up. And uh, we provide academic support in order to help them to do so. But the standard is the same. You know, you won't pass if you don't meet the standard. There's no question of our letting the quality of the degrees slip. Uh, that's not in the student's interest. It's not in the university's interest. It's not in the country's interest. Uh, we're not going to do it. And uh, I wish people would stop. Uh, assuming that we will. What's going to limit the number of black graduates in the future is basically finance and nothing else. And um, the government policy is and has to be that there can be no free tertiary education. In fact, you have to start contributing to the cost of your education uh, from standard nine onwards. Uh, and that's just a simple, hard economic and financial fact. What it all adds up to is that there's a limit to the number of university students the country can afford. It's going to leave a lot of expectations unfulfilled and it's going to create a lot of unhappy people and it's a really difficult problem for the government to deal with. The state needs to develop a system uh, of bursaries and loans. The substantial portion of it to be in the form of loans which would be repaid after the students graduate in the form of a graduate tax. And the loans are then repaid according to the level of income of the individual. And as they improve their situation, more goes back. That money becomes available for allocation to other students. But I think that this country really very badly needs that sort of thing. A university is a national asset. So we must make sure that our studies as well have that component of community service. Law students in particular must look at do communities outside campus, do they have access to justice in this country? And what can we do to give legal assistance to, to our communities? Students who are in the education faculty must, must also look at what can we do to, to the schools out there. Uh, engineers must look at the shirks around our country and, and we must begin to say all South Africans must be served so that when we ask for help, for loans, the community must know that we, we're not asking for loans to hide here. We're asking for loans because we can give back to the community. I always say that we are somehow a little lost. We try very hard to be this new society, but I think it's too late in the day for us to forget our prejudices, our pain, our head. And uh, so we need to make sure that our children 
really understand where they come from. So I think it must be instilled into our education system. People must know who they are and that they can do anything that the other one can do. That's the only way that you can build a new society.